classes in game design based on the books by George Phillies and Tom Vasil. Design elements of contemporary strategy games and contemporary perspectives in game design, both from third millennium publications, http 3mpub.com slash fillies. And today, this lecture is Lecture 10. I'm Professor Phillies, and this is the next lecture of IMG 2500 Design of Tabletop Strategy Games. Uh, I was beginning to comment on the lab reviews of the Carcassonne variant in which you played hands of cards rather than just one, which you discovered at the last moment. Most people liked it, a few didn't. The like and dislikes were somewhat for the same reasons, namely there was more opportunity for analysis. Uh, some people found that when you had hands of cards, you tended to grab a piece of the map which you viewed as your own, and other people did the same, and in at least one group, the person who did not do this apparently did quite well. Uh, the Puerto Rico um, variants, the economic variants, uh, you should have, you should, or if you haven't yet, you should now send your comments to the group that designed them. Uh, you will notice that a lot of the economic rules that were proposed did not do as well as might have been hoped. That is, there were features that never got used. There were features that were too complicated to use. Uh, there were features that would get picked off for improvement in playtesting, and you have now seen why you playtest rules, or at least you will see it as soon as the people who played your game variant send you the rules, as I am telling you now to do. Uh, the maps, as I said, most of the maps range from entirely what was needed up to really beyond the call of duty and excellent, so that was very positive. Uh, a, a number of you in analyzing variants, instead of making sort of general qualitative comments, did quantitative analysis of how rules worked. That can be very important. Uh, I am reminded of the uh, SPI post-World War III America Recovers Economically game in which the playtesters didn't lean hard enough on the rules or pay enough attention and eventually it was deduced when they put it into a computer and did simulations, which was actually pretty radical in the mid-70s. Uh, <clears throat> you could never get up to economic level four under the rules because the economic friction had been set too high. Uh, but that really never got, quite got noticed. In any event, I am today going to finish off my discussion of mechanisms. There are large numbers of mechanisms and bits and pieces. I finished last time to some extent discussing parts like dice and dice towers. I did skip over, gee, let's have continuous variable movement. How do you do continuous variable movement? You use rulers, and if you're going to have turns, and the turning radius is limited, you have this sort of square of cardboard with a circle on it and markers, and that describes your allowable turn. There was one of these in SPI Jutland for how tight a turn can you make with a battleship? Answer, not tight at all. Uh, a similar device, except it's a programmable game as well, is used in the game Techno Witches. This is Harry Potter brought to North America. Except since we're in North America, Young people ride not obsolete broomsticks, but vacuum cleaners. But it has movement parts. One might also note the peculiar game deflection, in which the, well, it's sort of like chess pieces, but you have mirrors on them. Why do you have mirrors on them? because the other playing tool is a laser pointer. And you use the mirrors to deflect the laser beams in interesting ways, leading to, for example, piece capture. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Parts 
Okay, let us shove ahead. And another whole mechanism is special events. Special events are things that alter the rules of the game, what the Germans would call rule breaking, but they alter it for, in general, a fixed period of time, long or short, often uniform more or less for all players. For example, the original Avalon Hill board war game, Tactics 2, had weather cards. You drew these little cards, they really were cards, and they had weather events printed on them, some of which, blizzard, were considerably more severe, and some of which were somewhat less dramatic. Uh, one might also note, for example, space station assault, in which you put your forces onto cards of a certain type, you draw cards, and the attacker forces kind of show up in uncontrolled and somewhat random order. <coughs> A more delicate version of this is found in the old GDW game Torgau. Torgau was a battle of Frederick the Great. And the Austrians were parked here defending, and Frederick the Great had the not entirely ideal idea of attacking from all sides and sent columns off. But we are not in 2010. Not only did the officers and enlisted men not have GPS systems, Many of them didn't have compasses or maps. And so their idea of navigation when they hit a crossroad was to ask a nearby peasant which way the village of thus and such was. Of course, the peasant realized that it might be bad news if he didn't know, so he always gave an answer. Often the answer was even right. So the columns set off, and their arrival times are randomized depending on how smart the peasants were. They were German peasants, so they uh, were at least not deliberately misleading. Oh yes, it's right down that road. Of course you can take a cannon through swamps. Everyone knows that. Um, there is also the game of Is, in which the special event cards basically determine the market value for various sorts of jewels in a semi-random way. Uh, one might also note Avalon Hill management, in which you are selling goods, and the price of the goods fluctuates, and sometimes is high, and sometimes is low. And sometimes there are misfortunes, namely you draw a card, and you must either pay off your workers or they'll go on strike. Um, there are special rules, oh, at some point you and your competitors have to pay dividends versus in any number of games, it's management games, and suddenly there's cash out the door to maintain the value of the stock. Uh, one might also note uh, Civil War 2061, you can find that one fairly easily, and the old Westinghouse, yes, the same Westinghouse game, Logistics Command, Uh, in which, in 2061, you draw a card at the start of a battle, and sometimes unfortunate or fortunate things have happened. Your ammunition supply has been disrupted. The other side's officers have had their loyalty purchased by your spies. Uh, that sort of thing. I'm not quoting necessarily real details. In Logistics Command, which was meant, this goes back to the 70s again, to sell third world countries on the idea that they should computerize their supply system. Um, there are certain flaws in this, it turns out. Uh, but the idea was sound. You draw cards and you have this maintenance issue or that maintenance issue, and it feeds into a very simplified, what looks, the board looks sort of like tactics too, but isn't. So those are special events. And there are all sorts of special events. And depending on how many you toss in, uh, it can provide a little noise. It's the equivalent of, uh, gee, I am facing something, and I draw my sword and swing, 
and I have three dice I get to roll, what is the die roll? Well, the special events cards are sort of a variation on rolling dice, except, you know, dice are fairly plain, bland. Special events cards, your sword shatters, are much, can be much more colorful if you, if you don't get carried away with them. Okay. Another mechanism programmed movement Uh, the notion in programmed movement is that instead of you getting to choose moves as you go, you have to specify in advance what is going to happen. And sometimes between the moment when you have specified your move and the moment when it is executed, interesting phenomena occur. And one notes well-known modern games, Robo Rally, Ricochet, Robot, and basically you have a, this is what will happen next, and it's like a Turing machine. How many of you know what Turing machines are? <coughs> oh, I would have expected in a group of CS people more. A Turing machine is an ideal computer. It has a paper tape. Well, this paper tape is not simply erasable. The moves come in one end and go off the other, and your robots make moves depending on what cards you put down a few turns in advance. Um, a variation on this, instead of you give commands to the robots, is in the game Darter, where, in essence, the spaceships are happy to do things as they're automatically and never change, and you are giving orders to the playing board. And you, instead of programming the movement of the units, you program the movement of space. Uh, I mentioned techno witches. In techno witches, you have a line of movement cards, and you can have a pre planned movement of some length. Uh, of course, there's a length limit. The advantage of pre-planned movement is you get to execute all of it fairly quickly as opposed to a little bit at a time. Uh, the disadvantage is A, things may change before you get the move out, and B, and there will be a lot of move, and B, the more out you have to predict what you should do, um, there are a lot of flight games like this, uh, the more likely you are to run into a technical difficulty like CFIG. Anyone know the abbreviation? Controlled flight into ground. <laughs> this is a very bad thing with aircraft. Oh, a great space race in which you have a certain number of cards and a certain number of slots you can put down the cards in. And this gives you certain options. Again, it's programmed movement. Similar to programmed movement, but not quite the same, is restricted movement. In restricted movement, you have a limited number of choices on what you can do. And there are various consequences and ways of Im implementing restricted movement. Uh, the simplest, which you've seen in Puerto Rico, is you may choose one role and only one role. And having chosen that one role, you're stuck with it. However, the next player will also move, and there are now two restrictions. First of all, they can choose a role and get the benefit, as does everyone else. But the only roles they may choose are roles that have not yet been chosen. The alternative, this is a game variant for Puerto Rico, is you choose a role. It's the next person's turn. They may choose any role also. So if you want, you might see Builder played three times in a row. <laughs> 
That would give a different game now, wouldn't it? Um, so you have restricted movement. Another variation on this, the game is called Shear, S-H-E-A-R, Panic. You correctly guess the player characters, or pawns anyhow, are sheep. The sheep are being sheared. There are nine allowed action cards, each of which, I'm not, I don't recall if they're actually cards. There are nine allowed actions, each of which may be used once and only once during the game, and therefore at the end of nine turns, the game is over. That's a movement restriction. Uh, a similar reset, but slightly different set of restrictions, you can reuse actions, is found in Doom, the board game. Yeah, there are the Marines, there are the demons, and there are a list of things that each of them can do. But on any given turn, you may only do one of them. And so there's a certain amount of resource allocation and consideration of what it is you want to do. Uh, the sheer panic one is all, a version is also seen in Nobody But Us Chickens, which is, gee, it's a flock of chickens in the pen, and there is a dog. And there's also a fox. The fox is hungry. The chickens would like to lay eggs undisturbed, and we go on from there, but it's a nice game, it's a clever game. You only have a certain number of moves which you can each use once and only once. Oh, let me take a more dramatic issue of restricted movement, which is also programmed movement. PDW I loud. It is a battle that Napoleon did quite poorly on. And so you have the map. And Napoleon's army is parked down here. And the Russian army, those numbers represent army corps. The Russian army is up here. And if the whole Russian army could get its act together quickly, it would have great ease in smashing Napoleon into the ground. The historic difficulty was that the Russian officers slept in. Uh, drinking parties do this. And therefore, on the first two turns of the game, the Russian player may only move two of his eight core groups of units. And then on the third and fourth, he may move four. And finally, on turn seven, he can move his whole army. But there's a little difficulty. There are two hidden movement cups. And they're filled with which army corps you are going to move. You get to choose if you're the Russian commander, say, three, five, three, five. But you must choose two complete turns in advance. And so you've chosen, before the game starts, you've decided what your, which units you're going to move your first two turns. And then at the start of move one, you decide who you're going to move on turn three. And you observe that you have to look ahead a fair distance to get the right people off the ground. You have to ride their question. Um, does Napoleon have to go, does the other side have to go through the same? No, Napoleon's whole army gets to move immediately. Uh, the French view celebrating as something you did after you won the battle. As the old saying goes, pillage before you burn. <laughs> okay, so that is restricted movement. It's a mechanism. There are lots of variations on it. Uh, restricted movement can be made very simple. This restricted movement rule is simply eight chits, each with a number on it that you hide in cups or write on a piece of paper, and then units that are grouped together. The French, the Russians can actually cheat a bit, and the Cossack cavalry get to move voluntarily at all times but it still puts some real thought into what the poor Russian player has to do. Okay, that's victory, that's um, restricted action.
Let's try another choice. And I talked about some of these a bit, but I don't think I quite talked about all of them. The notion in victory conditions, and I mentioned a number of them, are that somehow you have to determine which side won. Unless it's a purely cooperative game like Vanished Planet, which you'll be playing tomorrow twice, uh, wants to see how the rules work and wants to see if you can avoid being wiped out. In a purely cooperative game, either all the players win or all the players lose. And if the game is being designed for like first graders, uh, the victory conditions are extremely hard to avoid because we want to give positive, cheery thought to things. And by the time you play Vanished Planet for the first time, you will notice um, uh, we seem to have had all of our solar systems eaten by the monster. That's not a good outcome. Uh, however, you can play to elimination. You can do scoring. We've seen scoring. You can play to exhaustion of resources. That's one way you could bring things to a stop. Um, you can have a race game in which you can be the first to finish. Last to finish is harder to arrange. You have to be clever because if I tell the, per the winner is the first, is the last person to cross the finish line, mm -hmm. the normal response is, uh, let me take a nap for a few days. And then there are conditions which might be known to everyone or might be hidden. Each player has their own victory conditions and they're hidden. Uh, now I will come to an amusing game with more complicated victory conditions. Liberté is about the French Revolution. And there are three factions, red, white, and blue. Or maybe that's blue, white, and red. And the factions are attempting each to gain control of the country through a rather complicated scheme which includes controlling provinces and doing other things. Okay. And so the players each can do things that will advance a faction. Now we come to the trick. The players are not faction controllers. The players are simultaneously trying to take control by doing things of one faction or another. And if you are doing things to advance, for example, the white faction, you might, or the red faction, you might consider that you do not necessarily know in advance if you are going to own the red faction at, or the white faction at the end of the game. And so there are two levels of complexity here because you are playing the people in the background who are pulling puppet strings making things happen. And G, um, you notice there's this double layer of complexity. It's a very clever idea. Okay. Status markers. We eventually move over into things that will be familiar to people who play computer games because we have a battleship. This is a battleship from Avalon Hill, Bismarck. It's, rep it's represented on the board by a unit counter and then off to the side is a hitbox. And as the Germans and the British shoot at each other, the battleships take hits and at some point you will go to half speed, for example. And at some point, you have inconveniences like your guns ceasing to be able to fire. And eventually, the hitbox fills up and your ship sinks. OK? That's, what a, that's a status. And you could do this with paper and pencil. You can do it on the computer with little numerical displays. But you can do more fancy things. For example, suppose you have aircraft. Well, one answer, this is Avalon 
Hill, no, SPI, von Richthofen's War, you know, Snoopy and Friends. And we have a unit counter with an airplane on it. And printed below it is a number that shows the altitude of that airplane. And this was done in thousands of feet. They didn't really get up that high. But for each airplane, you have a full set of counters showing all of the possible altitudes. And as you change altitude, you have to switch counters in and out. You may consider, this sounds inconvenient. Another choice is you have an aircraft, and you have a separate counter, and you put the status counter down on the airplane counter. And because the status counter is down on the airplane counter, you can look at the little status counter and tell how high the airplane is. The advantage of this is you need somewhat fewer counters, not completely fewer, but you need fewer big counters and then you just have little counters. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that if each airplane has more than about one status counter on it, there are issues with stacks, fall, counters falling over, and such not, and this becomes inconvenient. And so we advance to the solution seen, for example, in Sopwith, in which each player gets a little control panel showing things like fuel and ammunition and altitude. I don't actually, I haven't looked at it in a long time, so what it actually shows may be a little different. Oh, maybe it shows direction, though that's visible on the map. Now, this is not historically realistic. The reason it is not historically realistic is that, almost without exception, World War I aircraft did not have control panels. The first American bomber to have a control panel is something you can look up on uh, Wikipedia, and it was slightly more recent than World War II. But as a control panel, it's a set of status markers. You could also advance, for example, to SPI Air War, where people got really enthusiastic with status this sort of thing. In addition to which, it was noted, if you're flying an aircraft and you make sharp turns, you lose kinetic energy. In fact, you lose a lot of kinetic energy in some cases, which is why you have this big engine that burns lots of fuel. And it's not that fighter aircraft go any faster than they did when I was your age. They really don't. They go, you can get up to about Mach 2, and that's about all you can find. Yeah, there are a few special types that go faster. Um, <clears throat> uh, SPI Air War was a good example of how complex can we make a board game in terms of, com of complexity of rules. And I mentioned kinetic energy loss. Well, if you have an aircraft, there is also roll one side or the other. There is also pitch, nose forward or down. And there is also yaw, which is the third axis, which is a little harder to do. It's, but you can rotate aircraft in different directions. And if you don't know what you're doing flying an aircraft and you want to turn it, you turn the wheel and that puts the rudder over. And if you're lucky, nothing much happens. And if you're less lucky, you've now put your aircraft into a, what is called a flat spin. If you do this with a World War I aircraft, you should start praying very hard, because they're very hard to get out of flat spins. Modern aircraft, it's less serious. Uh, and so there were neat things like, how do you actually turn? You bank the aircraft, and you pull the nose up. And that turns an airplane. Uh, at the first scenario in SPI Air War, I'm, this is a warning on what happens if the designer gets too enthusiastic about simulations, uh, was to fly the aircraft in a circle and get back to your starting point at the same altitude and speed at which you started, without controlled flight into ground. Many players took quite a while to figure out how to do this. Um, of course, the computer ones are much more complicated. There was a computer space shuttle simulator. We no longer have shuttles flying. Um, in which 
it was totally accurate. And someone worked out and told the folks at NASA, you can actually land one of these things without using the retro rockets, which surprised them no end. It turns out you can. It was never used, thank God. Okay, that's a bit on air status markers. And the problem with status markers, which you may be starting to figure out, is if you have a lot of status markers to keep track of, and you don't have a computer, one of you mentioned Material World as the game that commits suicide in this direction. Um, it gets really tedious to keep track of everything. Campaign for North Africa, in which every unit counter, all several thousand of them, have separate fuel, water, food, and ammunition status that have to be tracked and replenished is a good example of how far you can go if you're not restrained. Um, on the other hand, you can be clever or more clever on status markers. We will again talk about a war game. And so here is, this is actually a full strength German infantry corps in 1914. And then it has, if it gets into combat, its strength, strengths as reported rapidly go downhill. And there are three levels of depletion. And then it's dead. So how do you do this in a board game? Well, one alternative is, for each of the units in the game, you have, how many unit counters am I going to need? Let's all think, and you're going to be invited to hold up fingers. How many unit counters am I going to need if the four strengths are that? Hands with fingers. <coughs> and I see several hands showing with four. There is, however, an alternative. How can I do it with two? Well, you see, these cardboard things have a front side and a back side, and you can turn them over and cut the number of unit counters in half. This requires good printing and die cutting, but that's been possible for a long time. There is, however, another question. Are you supposed to put on like a die, a die or something? Oh, a dial? A die. Uh, well, the the problem with putting a die on top is that if you have a stack of a dozen of these, each with a dice in it, on, on, the stack gets unmanageable. If you can't stack units, that's a very sound idea. You use baby dice. Of course, baby dice are expensive. Die cutting and printing is cheaper. However, you are very close to what I was about to talk about, which is a big wooden block. Columbia Games, there are several other people who do the same thing. And it's a wooden block shaped sort of like this. And it's large enough and thick enough that it can be put on the board in the vertical position rather than flat. And on one side, you have four dots, three dots, two dots, one dot, whatever is on top matters. And there's some stuff in here. You can put writing here saying what it is. And the other side shows, for example, only, I'm giving a figurative image, it's colors. You can tell what this unit is. However, until it's gone into combat, the strength is invisible, and the other side can't tell whether this is some humongous collection of Americans or, <clears throat> as Saddam's army in 1991 surrendered to on one occasion, uh, three press photographers in a jeep. <clears throat> well, they did. It was a smart move on their behalf. So, I have described <clears throat> various mechanisms. <clears throat> Mechanisms, however, are like gears and cams. They're like 
resistors and capacitors and coherers and interocitors. They're parts. By themselves, the parts don't do anything. Even if you have a specification mechanism, all units may move four squares, all units may move on each turn. That's a specification, it's a movement specification. Even if you have a detailed specification of what the movement rule is, that's not a game. <clears throat> to take a game, you have to find some mechanisms and a theme and a sort of physical style you'd better have at some point, though you know what it is for this course, and a pattern of play, and you have to assemble these things into a coherent whole. It's like blending grapes for wine. You may end up with uh, hints of oak and tannin, and you may end up with traces of chocolate and melon and a nice polished aftertaste, but you actually have to do that. Now, there are several ways of making this work, which I will note in the last few minutes. Uh, one issue, which I will mention, is unique game versus series game. <clears throat> A unique game is one that you've put together that is substantially unlike any other, at least any other that you've made. That doesn't mean there isn't something out there. I mean, my good friend Sid Saxon had 20,000 board games in his collection. There were a lot, and his, it was by no means complete, there were a lot of games out there that you could have, and many of those games could be vaguely similar to what you made. But if you made something that is not like what you had before, it's unique. The alternative, which you see a lot in computer games, is, well, we have a movement engine, and we have a combat engine, and we have a graphics engine, and we will give it a new set of files, but it's the same game that it was before. Or if you go back to old Avalon Hill games, there was a classic series with games like Waterloo and D-Day and Stalingrad. and Africa Corps, and if you go to some of those websites I mentioned in the first class, you can find bunches of details on them. In fact, you can find pictures of the maps and the rules and everything else. And in many cases, you can even download a Vassal playing engine so you can see the map. However, there was an evolution, and in each game as you went to the next, the rules were improved, there might be more complexity, there might be a new innovation, but it was the same rules engine being improved each time. Sometimes there were critical improvements. To get to Africa Corps, which was sort of the last in the series, someone had to invent the notion of automatic victory. If you had a huge force here and a small force defending there, the defenders were simply made to go away, and other people could go through the position unhindered. That was not true in the earlier games. That's an innovation. So you have a series game, but it changes a bit from game to game. Of course, if you're careless, the series games get larded up with new rules, new variations, and it is like the miniatures rules I mentioned with 200 pages of tables on weapons effects. Okay, that's it for mechanisms. Uh, and Tomorrow we have a lab. Class dismissed.